ready to get back in our Father's Word. I'm going to start a new book today, First Peter. Peter was just, you know, there's one thing about his work. He's plain, he's common, he was a commercial fisherman. He talks in a language that just about anyone can understand because he lays it right out plain and level, whereby anyone can understand it. And, of course, he, this letter is written to the elect, those scattered abroad, the dispersed, meaning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It also applies as far as salvation is concerned to all people. But he goes more in depth to the return of Christ, to the three world ages. Quite a bit of depth in this book, uh, First and Second Peter. So you want to pay real close attention because it comes off in a simple way that a child can understand. His Aramaic name is Cephas, which means rock. And of course, uh, the word Peter itself in the uh, meaning Petra, which is to say a rock also. It is the rock um, that uh, Christ said, I'm going to use you to build the church on this rock, meaning himself. But Peter is a kind of a chip off the old block, you might say, a movable rock, not an immovable rock, which is to say Christ, our rock. Now, Christ himself would call him Barjona, which is a Hebrew word meaning son of the dove. And it's important that you note because Barjona, being wherever the Holy Spirit comes, is symbolic, that dove is symbolic of that. And that means it's directly from the Father. And you want to pay real close attention. So having said that, in as much as it is written to the election, the separated ones, and all concerned, makes it a fantastic book. Chapter 1, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's go with it. Peter, an apostle. Apostle means one sent forth, okay, of Jesus Christ. Who was he sent forth of? Of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, the anointed one to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus. That is to say, the elect scattered, okay? Strangers meaning strangers because they were God's children scattered in this world. <clears throat> Galatia, Cappadocia, and uh, Asia, and Bithynia, okay? Just all the places he had gone, okay? Verse 2, listen carefully, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit. Well, what Spirit? God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, shed on the cross, of course. Grace, that's unmerited favor, unmerited favor, unto you. And peace be multiplied. So much stated in that very verse, the fact that God did send our Redeemer. That blood was sprinkled, it was shed. And it was shed whereby we could have that unmerited favor. That means on repentance, you may not deserve it. You may not have all your ducks in a row as you should. But on repentance, He forgives you. Because, why? Well, He loves you. God loves all of his children. He may not love what you do, but he truly loves you. Uh, I, I have to draw attention to the foreknowledge of God. Peter will teach the three earth ages probably better than any other apostle. And it's important that you take the blinders off of modern day kind of Christianity and be a student of God's Word to know there was an earth age before this one. There's no disagreement with science that this earth is millions of years old. The Bible declares it. But you get some Bible thumper that'll stand up and say, this earth, according to the Bible, is 6,000 years old. Well, that's just a bunch of bunk, okay? Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. Didn't say when. But we know from then the earth became void and without form. God doesn't cre create anything void and without form. As it is written in Isaiah chapter 45, he created it to be inhabited and then it became void and without form because of Satan's overthrow, because of his fall. 
But this was the foreknowledge of God from the elect, those that stood. Why, well, why are they elect? Well, because they stood in the first earth age against Satan, and God chose them. That's why, as we have just finished the book of Romans, it states there that you are predestined. I'm talking to God's elect here. It doesn't make you special or better than anyone else. God is not a respecter of persons. It's just that you're a can-do type person. You know it. And many of you have known there was more to God's word since you were a child than you've been taught. So listen to Peter, and we'll learn a lot. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's to say Yahweh Almighty. Okay. Which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, not a dead hope, lively hope, okay, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Oh, death, where is thy sting? It doesn't have one, okay. Why? Because the moment someone passes from this flesh body, they instantly return to the Father, ever living, ever alive in Jesus Christ, he that paid that price for us. Uh, and always with the Lord. You may be on the wrong side of the gulf when you get there, as Christ would teach in Luke chapter 16. But you're there for judgment because God is the judge, not man, not this man or any other man. God, why? He, well, he knows your heart. He knows your mind. But has begotten us again, why? Well, when you're kind of born again, but born from above is the correct terminology as it is written in John chapter 3 in the manuscripts, that being born from above. But it all happened with that resurrection of Jesus Christ when he defeated death right in the very eyes of everyone. It began a new covenant, the new covenant, the New Testament. Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Do you understand that? It's not something that fades away or just wanes and gives out. It's there for you. It's a living hope. It's of a certainty. Christianity is not a religion. It's an actuality. And you're living it. You're a part of it. And do you understand what an inheritance is? When, when he resurrected, defeated death, we still had made the inheritance of the will, that is to say the first covenant that was made for us, which is a will. And you inherit eternal life by doing his will, by following him, by serving him, by loving him. And I don't want you to overlook the fact that it said reserved in heaven for you. Heaven is wherever God is, and he's coming to this earth, uh, as it is written in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, and forever being with him is heaven. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith, through what? Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, what, what is that talking about? Well, having the faith to know, as it is written in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, what does it say there? What does it say in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, that would transpire in the last days? That would be to say just before his coming. That both my sons and daughters shall prophesy, shall have dreams, shall see visions. Through what? Through the Holy Spirit speaking through them, as it is written. That is the revelation, and that reveals the true spirit, as it was spoken on Pentecost Day in a cloven tongue that goes out in every language. Not unknown, as many people mistranslate, but known. Why? Because man can't do that. The Holy Spirit can, whereby everybody hears it in the very dialect in the county you were born. What a fantastic inheritance. What a true father we have that at the last time, that's to say the end of time, he uses both sons and daughters. Many people, the way they would teach, you would think God had cut the daughters out. Well, God won't allow it. Okay. 
they're very much apart, as it is written in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. But it stems from, and the promise made in the Old Covenant, in, um, in the great book of Joel, chapter 2, in the closing verses, um, that both sons and daughters, those that keep the faith, that's why through faith, faith in what? Faith in our Father to know that His Word is true. His Word never changes. This earth will change. Time will change. But God's Word never changes. Mark chapter 13, documentation. It is important for you to know the revelation. That is to say, well, what does the word revelation mean? It means to reveal, to make known. Through what? Through the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You're in this life, you're going to have some temptations. They're going to be there. They're going to come. But, but uh, you're a can-do type person. You can cut it. You can do. Hey, you know, a little bit of a little bit of adversity takes a can-do type person. It's like putting gas in the tank. That makes them really can do. You know, just tell them they can't do something, and I promise you, they'll do it. Okay, they'll get it done. Do you know why they get it done? Because God has sees that they get it done. God will kick rocks out of their road. He will remove things, and they are overcomers because they're His election. Those that do bring forth that word, that truth, to both family, congregations, and the world. So, always remember when you think you're really loaded up with temptations, always remember 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Nothing will ever happen to you that isn't common for everybody. It happens to all of us. And know this, that God will never test you or tempt you over what you can handle. It may be a load. That means he knows you can really cut it. And the far finishing of the verse is that he will always give you a way through, a way out. He takes care of business. This is why when you're serving him, that's why you can rest assured. You can do it. Why? Because he's helping you. Verse 7, and the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, let your faith... Um, uh, be your badge of honor, your works. With faith, you have those works of, of what? Doing as God stated you would do, as we quoted from Mark 13 and Matthew 24, and Joel chapter 2, and Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Those prophecies by sons and daughters uh, just before the return of Jesus Christ. That's why, because you were true to Him. Meaning what? You weren't deceived by the false Christ. Many are going to be. It's going to be a shame. Listen to me. People will follow a man when that man can be as crooked as a dog's hind leg. And, and if that man has a smooth enough tongue and, and can present himself as, as um, something that he isn't, then people will forget about God's Word and follow the man. Traditions of men make void the Word of God. Well, what do you think they're going to do when the Antichrist himself appears? And as it is written, he will appear at the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial. Six, six, six. He's going to. The book of Revelation even tells you what he's going to do at the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial. I don't know. Have you ever read it? Revelation means to reveal. It should be revealed to you so you're not caught off guard. That being the whole purpose and your faith in Almighty God that you do not waver and that you always glory in Him regardless of what man may do following false ones. Verse 8. Whom, having not seen, 
You haven't seen God. Whom having not seen, ye love. You love him anyway. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believe him. Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's the words to that old song. Uh, joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know, when, when you haven't seen him. You know, many people saw Jesus on earth and walked and followed and listened, but still didn't have faith. Well, you haven't seen him. You've read the word, you've heard the word, you felt the presence of the Holy Spirit, and you love him. That counts as a lot. Okay. That's counted as faith. Okay. And through faith, we'll see your works. Okay. Verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. In other words, due to your faith, you save your soul. Why? Because you love him, and he is the Savior. This is why he is called Yeshua, or Jesus, because it means Yahweh's Savior. He sent him here to save. And when you believe upon him and put your faith in him, he's going to fulfill that promise to you, that you will receive eternal life by loving him, by following him, by having faith in him through his word, for Christ himself is the living word. The word became flesh and walked among us, and people loved him and followed him. He healed, but many at the same time disapproved of him. What? Well, they crucified him, the sons of Cain, basically, crying in that mob, that maddened mob, crucify him. He was doing it for you. Verse 9. Receiving the end, and we got that. Verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. All down through the years, the prophets themselves wanted to live at this time. Okay. Isaiah. A virgin shall conceive, and a child shall be born, and you shall call him Emmanuel, which is to say, God with us. And that's who Christ was, Emmanuel, God with us. And those prophets, all the way back to Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, the prophecy was made that he would come, and out of Judah would come that, that um, majesty, that... Um, that symbol of kingship, and through Levi, of which his mother was, of the daughter of Aaron, Mary. Mary's mother was uh, of, um, of the house of Levi, though she married a person of the house of Judah, bringing the law and the king together in the birth of Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ then became the law and the king, which is to say king of kings, and Lord of Lords, his title. That uh, all these prophecies brought this knowledge and information forth if you have read it, if you have absorbed it, and if you have the faith to know and to understand and to believe in him, though you have not seen him, you shall. And you shall walk with him, and he will walk with you. You know, though you have not seen him, he will never leave thee, he will never forsake thee. You can count on it. Verse 11. Searching what? Of what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Which, which scriptures would testify that. Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. His words on the cross, Psalms 22, gave it to in detail of how they would nail him to the cross, his arms pulling from, pulled from socket, soldiers gambling for his clothing at the foot of the cross. Uh, Psalms 22, verse 22. This happened for what purpose? As it is written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, whereby... He died on that cross, whereby in that he could destroy death, which is to say the devil. 
In other words, the devil ultimately his children brought it to pass the crucifixion. Now God can kill his child, which is Satan. He, Satan cre was created by Almighty God. Now God can destroy him without batting an eye. Why? Well, he's got it coming. And what is the Spirit of Christ? Well, naturally, it's the Holy Spirit. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father, Emmanuel, God with us. It was all written long ago, and you have to believe God's Word. When you absorb God's Word, there are no secrets. God forewarns those that, fore, that He foreknew. You know, it is a strange thing that where he would title this strangers in verse 1. The word strangers, why? Because uh, God's elect don't really belong here. They are strangers here because they belong with him. They are election. The, the, uh, the name Barbara, many people worry if they're named Barbara. Well, it means strange. Well, you're, you're in a, these flesh bodies are strange bodies to us. Scattered and sworn. I'll be careful how I say this because it can leave the wrong impression at times. But we are made in the image of God and the angels. I can repeat that by saying we're made Christ in the image of Almighty God and you in the image that you were in the first earth age. It's that simple. That laid out. No big mystery. And, and so it is that that spirit guides, directs. Verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us that did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit. The word is pneuma in the Greek, and it means spirit. Sent down from heaven, which things, to, which things the angels desired to look unto. In other words, I want you to grasp that thought. That when the Holy Spirit comes down and touches one of God's elect and uses them, the angels in heaven are interested. They look down to see how it takes effect. They're anxious to see how it happens, how, what you will do with it, what you will do with that information delivered to you by the Holy Spirit. The very angels in heaven rejoice when you bring forth that truth. What a fantastic uh, father we have that um, uh, the, the, um, the word here, the desire to look into is they, it, the Greek is stew for bend down to look. That, that, and that means taking a very close look. That, so you got a lot behind you, friend. Uh, don't, don't ever start angel worship or anything of that nature. But you got a lot pulling for you when you follow God's Word, when you teach His Word, when you share His Word, just a tidbit. You might say, well, I would never talk to you, maybe just one person. Don't you realize that that one person is important to God? If he had a hundred and that one was here, he would leave the hundred and go after that one? And perhaps that he sent you to get that one? You see, God works in marvelous ways. And certainly, that Holy Spirit, when it is in operation, the very angels themselves, it's no mystery that the prophets loan for this time, but the angels themselves bend down and stoop and look and watch, observe the events that transpire in this generation of the fig tree. Verse 13, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. You listen to me. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. That means you be serious, sincere. And hope to the end for the grace, that's the unmerited favor that is to be brought unto you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where is that written? Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. That spirit will speak through you when you're delivered up, when it is revealed, when it is supposed to come forth. And you will do just fine. God depends on you if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. If that sounds a little strange to some, put her on the shelf and let her sit there.
Okay. You'll do fine. Peter goes into much depth, even in common teaching, but it's very simple. It's plain, and it's laid out plain and level where a child can understand. So don't wrestle with it. Simply know and understand that our Father speaks beforehand. Well, what does He do in Matthew 24 and Mark 13? He guides you. You don't even have to talk. He talks through you, taking care of you, using you. That's work, my friend. That's God's work. And boy, does it pay dividends in our Father's heart and mind when he, the love pours forth into his children that are strangers in this land. Why? Because there is elect. They're here to help others. Don't, don't read more in that than there is. You have two ends of the spectrum. You have those that are, have free will, and you have election that God will interfere in their lives as it is written in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. God's elect don't even know what to pray for. Therefore, he will intercede in their lives. He will move them where he wants them. It is written. Read it sometime. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. That's when Antichrist appears on this earth and God's elect take care of business. Verse 14. As obedient children, that means obey, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Ignorance means not knowing. It's not a bad word. It just means when you, when you didn't know any better. But when the Spirit touches you and claims you, you do know better. And our Father has a need for you. Because, uh, you know, when it says gird up your mind, do you understand what the girt is? In the gospel armor, the girt is your belt. It's what holds your britches up, all right? Well, what he's saying in the spiritual sense is gird up your mind. You take the Word of God and you seal it in your forehead, whereby you're familiar with it. You don't have to rememorize every word. Unless you're a teacher, it's good to have a good memory. But just so that you know the flow of God's love and His Word, that's sufficient to gird your mind, to know what God has said. You know, it's like reading tomorrow's newspaper. He's told you what's going to happen. All you have to do is read it, observe it, understand it, and most of all, believe it. For it is true, it is a fact, and it shall come to pass as it is written obedience to that and leaving off things of the world they become so insignificant when you see the beauty in Matthew 24 Mark 13 and Luke 21 verse 15 but as he which hath called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation in other words set aside that's what a that's what a saying is is a set aside one and as God uh, called you and is holy, you make up part of the temple. The very temple of God in the end times is the many-membered body of God's election. That's why you must gird up your mind. And um, you're not going to be a goody-goody two-shoes while you're in the flesh. You're going to have weak moments. You're going to have to overcome those moments, but you can. No step for a stepper, okay? Can-do type people when you have God's love and His Word behind you. But there will be those temptations. But you will rise against it, for Christ will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will always lead you and be with you. So follow Him, verse 16. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 11:44. Um, and even back to verse 5. What, what, what did verse 5 say? Who are kept by the power, dunamis, dynamite of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's what it says back in verse 5. And that's, that's, that is holy. Okay. The fact that he's coming again. He is the judge. Verse 17. And if ye call on the Father who without respect of persons 
judgeth according to every man's work. That's W-O-R-K. Okay? He judges what? He judges according to your work. Did it say he judges according to your faith? No, it did not say that. You can have faith, and if you have no works, your faith is dead. What, what have you done? Nothing. What is nothing worth? It's worth nothing. That's common sense. So man's work past the time of your sojourning here in fear. That means reverence. You revere him, love him, and, and, and reach out. What, what is God's work? Do you, do you, have you ever read Revelation chapter 14, verse 13? Do you know what it says? The only thing you can take with you when you go to heaven is your works. I'm going to say that again. The only thing that goes with you when you die in these flesh bodies and go to heaven, the only thing you can take with you is your work. Because as it is written in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8, that your works weave together the fine linen that you wear in heaven. No work, no linen. Where does that leave you? Naked as a jaybird, a baby jaybird. Uh, no work, no linen. Okay. It's that simple. So what, what is work then? Well, a mother taking care of her children. When a mother reaches out and with her loving hand guides and leads and directs her children, that, that's God's work. Because those babies belong to God freely. He loans them to you. And, and that nature itself takes over and loves them and leads them. And a father that provides for that family is justified and is a God's work. Or planting a seed or sharing a truth. That's work. Okay. And God counts it so. So uh, understand, never always protect your credibility. Some people feel they have to overdo just, just let God control, wait on Him, opportunities prevail, and He loves you, and He considers that work. Don't miss any of these lectures in this, these books of Peter. There's a lot of information here that strengthens one in this generation of the fig tree. Don't miss them. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please?